And our final 10 questions from the 2018 very challenging National Chemistry Olympiad exam. Um, this one here, we're looking at two different ions that are uh, structural isomers, but the carbon and nitrogen are switched places. So if we look at that, so having the carbon in the middle means that we're going to end up with a triple bond to the nitrogen and a single bond to the oxygen. That's going to give us a negative formal charge on the oxygen. Like that. And the other, we're going to have the carbon here. There's a triple bond to the nitrogen and then a single bond to the oxygen. So that's a problematic because that ends up putting an extra formal charge on both the carbon, which is not a great place for it, and the nitrogen. So obviously this is a better structure uh, or a more stable structure. So then it says that the uh, cyanate is more thermodynamically stable than the other isomer. That is of course true. And then the second one says the carbon nitrogen bond is shorter than the carbon oxygen bond in the gas phase cyanide ion. Regardless of which structure we're looking at, even if we consider in the resonance uh, where we're going to see perhaps maybe a little bit of, of resonance here and there uh, on this one. Um, this one, the carbon nitrogen bond is of course going to be shorter because of that triple bond. So we're seeing that both of those are true and therefore we're picking C. Okay, 52. I'm not great at really kind of rationalizing uh, the final step of this, um, but we do. what we have here is we have the cis and the trans form of the two isomers, and those can be separated by fractional distillation. They will, they will attract each other differently. And so we know that, that these two are incorrect and we're choosing between A and B. At that point, the fact is you have to pick out which one of these two is gonna to stick together better than the other. Um, and I don't fully, I kind of go back and forth. Like on the one hand, I could say, okay, well, I've got all my chlorines on one side. That's going to create a strong dispersion force, which could then be used to attract another one. But then what's going to happen with the other side? How does that fit together with three dimensions? I'm not very clear on. The correct answer to this was B. Um, I ended up with A, thinking that I could kind of align these better, but, but I'm not really clear on how to make a prediction for that in the future, except that it seems that the cis isomer for this works best. Um, this one is a little tricky because this is a bidentate ligand, meaning that the nitrogen here is forming an interaction with the cobalt, so is the nitrogen there, which means that I have two interactions there, and I have two sets of those, so that's four interactions, and I have another two bromide ligands in addition to that, so I have six different things, and therefore the only shape possibility for that would be octahedral. Um, sometimes you will see this it's kind of a, here's the nitrogen and here's the other nitrogen kind of loop. So this is the two carbon groups, and then you would have another loop, and then you would have the two bromides. Um, but anyway, long story short, it's got to be six things. That's octahedral. That's the only possibility. 54, I thought the best strategy for this was to go through and eliminate things that were obviously incorrect. Um, so a lot of these are kind of hinting at bond length due to bond angle. And so essentially we have for the SF4, we've got the two axial positions, and then we have the two equatorial. It is SF4, right, Petra? Yeah. And then we have this lone pair in that equatorial position. So axial SF bonds are longer is what the claim is, and they're trying to explain why. Uh, they experience a greater repulsion from the other fluorine ions in the molecule. That's not true because this is going to experience the greatest, this is going to cause the greatest electron repulsion more so than anything else. Um, so we wouldn't expect these to be the explanation as to why. The equatorial bonds are longer because the equatorial SF bond angle is the smallest in the molecule. We know that that's not true because we have a 90 degree bond angle here and these have 120. So C is incorrect. And then the equatorial SF bonds are longer because they experience greater repulsion from the lone pair on the sulfur. The lone pair is going to cause the angle to push these closer together, but that's not going to change the bond length. So D is also looking bad. At that point, we go back and we say, okay, the axial, um, these two fluorine sulfur bonds are longer because the two fluorines must share bonding in the same orbital. I don't know whether that's true or not, uh, but it makes sense in the fact that we would expect the P orbital there to be involved. I don't know why that would make necessarily the bond longer. Maybe it's because these electrons are experiencing greater repulsion, but it seems logical, and the other three are wrong, and so I'm going to go with A. All right, 55. I'm not 100% sure on one of the wrong answers here. 
Um, the IUPAC name of this being 4-methyl is incorrect because we would start our chain on this side, but that's definitely a draw for a lot of people to put as an incorrect one. The chirality is correct because we have a carbon bond to a hydrogen, a CH3, a CH2CH3, and a CH2CH2CH3. So we have a hydrogen, one carbon, two carbons, three carbons, that's four different groups. D is going to be correct. Six primary hydrogens is just kind of gibberish, that's not correct. And the last one, radical chlorination gives one chloro four methyl hexane. Uh, I don't see any particular problem with that because it is definitely possible that we would end up making this a CH2 with a chlorine. chlorine. And my impression is that that would count as a branch and I would therefore label that as a one and that as a four at that point. But for some reason that's not true. So perhaps the major product is the issue. Um, that's maybe a minor product, or maybe I'm wrong and that could be the main, but I don't think so. I think it must be about the major minor, causing that to distinguish. Okay, so here we're looking at the chair conformation. So the chair conformation for a cyclic hexane is when you have your six carbons, kind of like this. And the key thing for here is that um, the up, I'm going to call them up this way and down this way, uh, the up and the down rotate between being in the equatorial position and the axial position. So the correct choice on this one is C. And the kind of idea behind that is that the up position going up means that the um, next up position would have to be in the axial state. And then the down position ones, we'll do it in a different color. So we have the down here, and then this one would be in the equatorial state. So if we look at that then, in order for both to be in the equatorial state, we need one to be above the plane and one to be below the plane on the adjacent carbons in the most stable chair conformation, and that would be C. All right, this one I got wrong. I am not 100% sure um, the reason for that. So I just did this without any hydrogens to kind of keep things simple. So I had five carbons with the double bond there. I had five carbons with a double bond there. So those are my only two five carbon straight chain alkenes that work. If I go to put the carbon double bond in the next spot, that's really just the same as this one because it would then invert the chain. So then I did four carbons in a row. I can put the double bond here, and then I need a branch. So I can put a branch here, or I can put a branch here. But I can't put another branch there because then that would create a longer chain and I'd be back to this way. And then the other thing I can do is I can do four carbons like this but then have one carbon coming off of one of these two atoms. And because they're symmetrical, that should be the only one. If I flip it to here, that doesn't make any difference. So I picked five, the answer was six, which means that there's one more. So obviously a cyclic compound would give us C5H10, but they say acyclic. And they say distinct, which I think is vague and ambiguous on purpose. And what they're getting at is that this one here can be both the E or the Z, or it's just as a trans form. And so this one is two isomers rather than one, and that prompts us from going from five isomers to six. So they are counting the stereoisomer as a distinct isomer because the E and the Z form are so locked in and different. This one, I have no idea what's going on. Uh, a lot of A, C, and D look very similar. And when I drew out the structures, this one was the weirdest looking one. I have a CH3 to a CH, and then O, CH3, OCH3. So I picked that one and it ended up being correct. When you look at a lot of the other structures though, I'm not very familiar on enol chemistry, but I think that might be something that's playing a role here because I see a lot of aldehydes and I see a lot of two oxygens separated by a small position, except for maybe here where there was an elimination reaction. So I don't really know how to figure out what the solution to this is or why this one is not correct, but B was the answer. If you know on that, please comment and let me know. Uh, 59, I was not sure on, but I remembered back from organic time that definitely when we have a triple bond like this, that that is a decently acidic hydrogen. So if we have a very strong base, and this is a very strong base, that that would deprotonate. Um, most of the other ones are just incorrect, so even if you didn't know that, you might have been able to eliminate because propine absolutely would react with bromine, bromine sorry. Um, and then propine undergo 
was catalytic hydrogenation or platinum, or propane is not. Both of those would undergo catalytic hydrogenation where you add hydrogen. Uh, and then this one is readily hydrated to pH zero, or propane is not. So we're talking about adding a water with an acid catalyst, and again, both of those happen. So we could eliminate all three um, if you weren't familiar with that. You had to take an organic chemistry. And then the last one, I'm not very familiar with the biology, biochemistry stuff. Um, so the correct choice here is B. What's happening is that as the um, competitive inhibitor is interacting with the enzyme, the, the substrate that we want to react is still reacting, but it's happening less frequently. Um, and it's still occurring at a constant rate, which indicates that we're not running into a limitation. So originally I thought this might be curved because at some point we end up with a different proportionality of the competitive, competitive inhibitor to the actual substrate, but that's not the case here, and so that shouldn't be the case here, that the amount is somehow limited within the system that's reacting. And so B shows us that we decreased our rate, but also kept a constant linear rate. So that's B.